Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to another episode of Justice for All Now. I'm your host, Hannah Zaberi, and you're watching us on Muslim Network TV, America's only Muslim focused television network. You can always watch us 24 7 on Galaxy 19, Roku TV, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. Today I have um, another episode of Women in Justice. Our guest today is Jenny Bencumo Suarez. She's a Latina cross-cultural community organizer, and she's been part of the Abolish ICE and Sunrise movements dedicated to immigration rights, reproductive justice, and climate justice. She's based in Kentucky. In 2015, Jenny was the recipient of American Youth Leadership Program and traveled to Cyprus to study near Eastern environmental policy and intercommunal conflict. She studied Arabic in Morocco and gained her TEFL certificate teaching high school students there. Now she studies Latina, Latin American and Latino studies and Middle Eastern Islamic studies at the University of Louisville and is an Explore Brazil scholar. Jenny was the hub coordinator at Sunrise Louisville Hub, a volunteer at La Casida Center and has been recently hired as the SEIU Labor Union um, as a union organizer. With the core principles of conviction, passion, and consistency, she strives for liberation and justice within a collection of movements. Welcome to the show, Jenny. Hi, Salam Alaikum. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Um, I would love, I know we read an introduction about you, but I really want to get to know you and just, and I would love for you to describe yourself. Please introduce yourself to our audience and describe your work in more detail. Hi everyone. Um, so as she said, my name is Jenny Bencomo Suarez. Um, I'm a community organizer, I'm an abolitionist and I'm an I believe in intersectionality. I also believe in internationalism. Um, I just recently graduated with my BA from U of L. Um, and then during the coronavirus pandemic, I was actually ironically laid off from the labor union. So then I started working more in mutual aid efforts this year to ensure that people who are getting laid off were housed. Um, and then the uprisings happened in Louisville, Kentucky, um, as they were happening globally, right? It has global uh, implications these uprisings especially in the United in the United States where there's major police brutality and so we are on the streets demanding justice for Breonna Taylor now we're on day 80 something and the folks are still active still demanding justice for Breonna Taylor and still demanding for systemic change to defund and abolish the police so those have been my efforts most so most so recently rather than academic um because we really need people on the ground. We need people to be active and we need people to continue fighting. Just put your mask on, get some hand sanitizer and let's go. And that's so important because a lot of times when the headlines move on, people tend to move on too. So what have you learned in this these past 86 days that you wish you knew 86 days ago? What I had, what I wish I could have learned uh, before the 86 days was, I mean, I knew that there was um, mass corruption, but that it went this deep mm -hmm. and how many people are complicit in gentrification, complicit in um, not doing enough, you know what I'm saying? And so what I wish I would have learned before these 86 days um, was also how resilient people are in a global pandemic. Um, Cause I was always aware, like I had always felt like, you know, people for a variety of reasons, right? From capitalism to other um, systemic circumstances are not able to be as present on the streets. However, for as God awful as coronavirus is, I don't want any of us to go back to pre COVID-19. I mean, you had folks working 40 plus hours a week making minimum wage, not being able to be politically active in the process. And so now you're seeing how these uh, uprisings have catapulted because people are now able to, to be present for you know politics, for to demand better, to demand justice. 
I don't, you know, I think that so many of us were quick to assume that people perhaps were apathetic or just didn't feel moved enough. But in reality, it's like when you're working for so many hours, when you're working two, three jobs, you're not able to be present. You're not able to hit the streets. And so with pretty much half the nation being unemployed, now you're seeing mm -hmm. these new waves of new leaders and new um, recently radicalized, politicized activists hitting the streets, many of whom are young people. So, yeah. And that is something that we're seeing across the country. We're seeing this because it's affected every strata of society. Uh, and this is something that is so heartwarming to be able to see that, especially for those who've been on the streets for years and years and years, the, the new wave of people joining, um, joining, you know, others on the street is really heartwarming. And, you know, so that is something definitely. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit more about you first. So we're going to jump right straight into all the justice work that you have dedicated yourself towards. Um, and we have so much to talk about. So how did you first arrive at your journey of political and social activism and what inspired you uh, to become such a strong advocate for marginalized communities? I think it's always like a tough question for me because I think as um, people who oftentimes are labeled as the minorities, which is now a term that I'm recently pushing back on because I think people like you and me um, constitute part of the global majority. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, especially white Americans and settlers um, in the United States um, and Israel have to reconcile with what their identity is outside of settler states, right? And outside of Europe, um, because black and brown people are the global majority. Um, but, you know, having been labeled that and having um, been living in such a in such a messed up country in a number of ways where there's so many systemic issues and being the daughter of immigrants, I think I always grew up um, incrementally radicalizing, right? Um, so my parents are people who read a lot, who like to stay educated. We, you know, watch the news a lot growing up and but also growing up in an immigrant neighborhood and also seeing how, you know, my family, when they migrated from Cuba, how is it that my father, um, who was an economist, a college professor, now has to work two, three jobs for us to sustain growing up and for me to have access to health care because he works at UBS overnight. So that's what grants him healthcare. But growing up, it's like you start asking more questions. Why is a universal human right, such as healthcare, being attached to a job? What happens if you lose that job? What happens if you get injured at the job and you can't perform the job anymore? Things of that nature, right? And then also seeing um, the tensions between the United States and Cuba growing up and always, me always feeling like I was in the middle of it. Um, I don't believe that, you know, sanctions are um, something that should occur against any country because it's not it's not like it affects the government at most it affects the people so mm -hmm. when you see that the people are economically you know being strangulated and then on top of that they're putting more restrictions on cuban americans on in terms of how much money they're able to be uh you know to send home and then on top of that there's just so much i i don't i don't know what to say you know growing up we've had to see uh 9 11 and we've had to see how the consequences of 9-11 and how much that's affected immigrant communities, especially Muslims, and then with the creation of DHS and ICE and how much that's affected um, the Latino community as well as other undocumented communities. And so by the time I was in high school, I had these feelings around it, but I didn't have exact, exactly like the vocabulary to describe what I was feeling. And so after having more conversations with other people and after reading more and being like, ah, so that's what they did to illegally invade Iraq, that is US imperialism. So that is interest of oil at the expense of lives in the global south so that is putting profit over people and then on top of that they're sending um lower income working class americans to go fight a war what have the iraqi people ever done to people like you and i how is that a threat to national security and so when i was seeing how in high school there were certain folks that were able to go to college and then also 
there was other folks of a lower income who didn't see any other route to sustain themselves other than joining the U.S. military. Mm -hmm. And so it was really exciting to see how, for the first time, we had a Democratic Socialist candidate, Bernie Sanders, who was demanding that uh, we have free higher education, that we do have free uh, like universal health care and things like that. And then when I moved to Morocco after I graduated high school, um, and the disappointment and anger I felt to see that Donald Trump had been elected because they decided to once again choose a mediocre centrist candidate that doesn't move people, Hillary Clinton. Of course we lost. Hmm. Of course we lost. And so me being in Morocco the day that Trump got elected and seeing how many Moroccans were saying or children were saying the West hates us because we're Arab and Muslim, that broke my heart. And so... I've definitely dedicated moving onward to connecting the dots of international struggles and having folks understand that we need to be in solidarity with each other. Like Muslims need to be in solidarity with Latinx people and Latinx people need to be in solidarity with urban black communities and so on and so forth. And so, yeah, it's it's been like an incremental <laughs> series yeah. of radicalization. I can't say like this is the pinpointing mm -hmm. event in my life um, in which I decided to be an organizer. I think also in high school, I started getting more involved um, with um, community organizers and mm -hmm. radical black and brown women um, outside of my high school, because I also went to a predominantly white high school and I never really felt like I fit in. So I was always trying to seek community outside of my high school. Um, so yeah, yeah this word when we, you know, and this is for our audience, maybe uh, many of them when they hear this world radical, right? Especially as uh, the Muslim community, Absolutely. because that's been something that has been used against us to criminalize us and um, treat us as inherently violent. Um, what define this word for for yourself, for the people, for the work that you do? What does that mean? What does that mean to you? I definitely hear you on how that word um, has been used to criminalize not only Muslim communities, but I think black and brown communities at large, especially whether it was the Black Panthers movement in the 60s and 70s. So I, I definitely hear you on that. To me, the word radical means a commitment to standing up for what is right and the belief that um, it is above socially constructed borders and nationalities. And it means the commitment um, to uplift solidarity, to uplift universally given human rights, mm -hmm. by almost any means necessary to get that, uh, to get what we need to secure basic needs, to secure human rights and dignity and justice. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, being radical is um, also a commitment to uh, speaking truth to power, even if it makes people uncomfortable, um, not messing with respectability politics. So I think oftentimes people love to tone police um, the most repressed, the most marginalized. And so it's also that belief that no, you will not silence me. No, you will not tone police me. Um, I might cuss at a politician because <laughs> honestly, um, I think that we need to disrupt power. I think that that, that is what a radical means. Um, and it's terrible that that word has been used to, hyper, uh, to hyper-criminalize Muslim people. I think that, you know, a lot of young Muslims are also beginning um, to identify themselves as a radical, and that has nothing to do with terrorism. I think also we need to redefine what the word terrorism I think the United States um, has committed a lot of terrorist acts against black and brown communities, not only in the United States, but globally. Um, yes, <laughs> I hear you. I hear you so much. Uh, I want to know what it, what radical organizing in tech Kentucky looks like. I mean, as, as someone perhaps who lives in... Uh, a, a blue state or a state that has, uh, you know, maybe deeper roots in in organizing of that sort. Tell me what that looks like, because from where we're at, 
all we see is this is, Kentucky is the place that's like stopping progress in this country because of the variety of people that, that have been elected there. So, um, yeah, what does that look like for you? The first thing I want to establish is um, the South, the American South is actually one of the most diverse regions in the United States. And now we are actively being held hostage by right wing forces that consist of actors like Mitch McConnell. Um, so radical organizing has always existed in the South. Um, the Highlander Center in Tennessee is a huge monument that speaks volumes to radical organizing. Um, Eastern Kentucky, yeah, there, you know, uh, there's a bunch of rednecks there because also redneck. Now it has a more negative connotation because folks have twisted that. But redneck always used to mean that it was white folks, you know, working class white folks, especially in rural communities, being in solidarity um, for um, anti-racism and economic justice efforts. So, I mean, I know hella folks in, in Eastern Kentucky that are very much down for the cause that have been organizing, even some of whom that hysterically enough like to even call themselves born bread communists. Um, <laughs> I think that in, in Louisville as well, um, we have always had a, a presence mm -hmm. of organizing. I know in the 80s, there was a lot of strong labor union organizing. Um, and then more recently, with the influx of immigrants that started coming in from the 90s, from Iraq, from Cuba, from all over the world, now we're seeing that the children of those immigrants, people like me, have, in, have been very active uh, recently, but you've seen that minorities, people who are called minorities and immigrants, have had a more pre uh, a more more of a presence to organize in the past 10 years. Um, there's been plenty of um, immigrant rights organizers that have popped up, La uh, Latinx leaders, Muslim leaders, um, so I definitely want to uh, disrupt the idea in folks' heads that this is very much so a red state. Yeah, we do have Trump supporters. Yes, you will You will probably go to a rally in which the other side will be white supremacists. I mean, that's something that we've always had to deal with in the South, right? Things get really intense in the South. You know, if you get arrested for a civil disobedience action in DC, you're out of jail, most likely in a couple hours, if it was peaceful. Here, it's like you get arrested for 18 plus hours and you're probably gonna be denied food, water, medical attention. I mean, it's really intense, but I think that with the intensity of living in a region like this, um, that is what further radicalizes folks more um, to, to become organizers, to become activists, to resist the system. And so now coming into, we're going into November, what sort of organizing are you seeing that you're super proud of, that you, and I, I hear I hear the history, what is currently happening in Kentucky? This is, um, this is something that interests everybody uh, because as you know, you've heard, you know, you've, you've experienced it. What, I mean, I, it, it ends up being our like bane of existence. Like everything gets blocked by Mitch. So how are we ditching Mitch in, um, in Kentucky coming November? That's going to be a harder question. That's going to be a, a, a much harder question for me to answer because mm -hmm. for folks who don't know, Charles Booker was a young black man or is a young black man from West End. He says, you know, from the hood to the holler, we're going to be fighting for a Green New Deal. We're going to be fighting for racial and economic justice. And he was um, our most progressive candidate in the fight to ditch Mitch. But because of coronavirus and people needing to do absentee voting, well, the day that they opened up voting, um, in-person voting, there is only one voting place available for people to go to in Louisville. So there was major voter suppression. And so I, I don't think that we've um, been able to disrupt fully that barrier yet the way that, you know, we want to make gains like folks in New York have with electing an AOC or, you know, people in Minnesota have with electing an Ilhan Omar. And so now a lot of people are, of course, um, outraged that uh, many of their votes were not counted that, uh, because I mean, in, in, the, in the polls, Charles Booker was ahead of Amy McGrath. Mm -hmm. And so with Amy McGrath, 
she's someone I like to honestly, quite frankly, call a mediocre centrist. I don't think that she is someone that inspires the people. I mean, one one of the things she had said a while back was, oh, well, we're not letting Donald Trump do what he needs to do. And this is someone who's running as a Democrat. Mm. And so it's highly problematic, her platform. I think it was extremely triggering for Muslim communities and for anyone that's been, uh, that has had to flee imperialism or uh, militarism in their home countries when her political commercials was her flying in a fighter jet mm. and her talking about her experience in the military. Um, I do not believe that she is running on a platform for you know healthcare for all. And so honestly, someone like Charles Booker that's had the experience of you know being in poverty, coming from a lower income um, urban community, is someone who a lot of Kentuckians could resonate a lot more with, even folks from Eastern Kentucky, from Paducah, from Lexington to Louisville. And so now we're being met with how do we convince people who are already exhausted, that are tired of being dismissed, that are tired of being silenced to vote for another centrist, just so we have Mitch out of office. So I, I don't know how this is gonna go. I mean, recently in the polls, I think she was like even like what, four or five points behind Mitch. And so I think that looking beyond electoral politics and looking beyond um, the system at large and like how do we replace the systems that are not serving us with structures that will nourish us, that will sustain us moving forward. Um, yeah, because I, I can't look at someone in the face, someone, um, you know, because I've had some Muslim friends of mine being like, I, I don't think I can vote for her. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, with people trying to shame people into voting for people like this, I don't think that's inspiring. I don't think that's helpful, helpful at all. Um, yes, voting can be used as a, a mechanism of um, harm reduction. We honestly need to start looking beyond harm reduction and how do we be more inclusive of people at large who have been disenfranchised so long from even the ability to vote. I mean, thankfully, Governor Bashir uh, reinstated the right to vote for many felons, but that's just not enough. It's not enough. Like we, these candidates, they're just not it. <laughs> So are there uh, candidates that on the ballot that have are inspiring that people are getting behind? I know that honestly, one of the more inspiring um, politicians we've had was well Charles Booker him, when he was when him being um, House Representative. Mm -hmm. We had Attica Scott, who's like our version of AOC, who has very much stood up for immigrant rights, who has very much stood in uh, favor of a Green New Deal who has very much been in solidarity with all kinds of communities and has really stood up to other political actors that have not served us, um, who have disenfranchised us. So those are the people I think that are the most inspiring in Kentucky. Um, but I think looking beyond this election of like, how do we build power from the ground up, not just in the political system, but also outside of the political system. and. For those who do want to run for office, how can we encourage them to run um, for office sooner, right? Um, so that they do build up this platform and so people do know who they are and what they're about so that we can beat the Mitch McConnells because there's plenty of <laughs> obstructionists in our state. So one of the uh, biggest components of your work has been climate justice advocacy and raising awareness about the Green New Deal. So what does um, at climate justice advocacy mean for you? And tell us the ways that, um, that you've worked on this uh, very extremely important issue uh, in your life. Um, definitely last year when we were able to be more uh, outside of our homes without a mask, um, there was some direct actions that the Sunrise Movement had did um, in DC that I was a part of. Um, and that, that's really good because then we're, we're bringing young people to take on, um, a more larger stance and being like, no, we are going to be loud. We are going to disrupt. We're not going to obstruct our pathway to climate justice. I believe that was around the same time that Mitch McConnell was trying to, um, shut down the vote mm -hmm. for a pathway to a green new deal. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so we disrupted that, I think. Then after that, we started taking on a larger role of educating the community mm-hmm. on what is a Green New Deal and what does climate justice mean. So a Green New Deal means um, that this is economic legislation for the country to transition to 100% green energy within a span of 11 years, because that's all we have left to stop irreversible climate change while also creating millions of good paying jobs for people. So that was something that was very inspiring because I think oftentimes what happens is people uh, become misinformed, right? Well, I need, we need coal because these, you know, these jobs are what uh, sustains people. And it really doesn't. I mean, how many people have died from black lungs? So it's like, if we can train these people to transition out of uh, coal energy and into green energy jobs, it would be a much more brighter, sustainable future. Um, so that was something that we tried to do, especially like, you know, town halls and meetings um, on engaging folks. So that was- you know, like I want to let's let's, you know, dig into that. Mm-hmm. A lot of young people who want to get into this work don't know where to start. Mm-hmm. Don't know what does that mean? How do, how do you organize a town hall? Who do you bring to a town hall? A lot of folks think you have to be extremely politically active or uh, civically active to be this, do this. So I want you to break down some of those barriers that people have set up for themselves. I think yeah. definitely for young people to not be shy to show up to a meeting mm-hmm. um, and definitely make their voices heard and to take up space. Um, and to demand for better. Um, I know that the Sunrise Movement does have hubs in various cities, but then also on their website, they have um, links for how to create a hub, how to join a hub, how to plug in. I think the good thing about a lot of the youth-led movement is that they've been able, through social media and online especially, Um, create a pathway for people to join and to create community with that. Because I think that a lot of the work requires community. It requires that we have conversations. And so definitely I want to encourage young people to start having these conversations with their other friends and showing up for one another and start attending these meetings. Because I think also a lot of times what happens is that people get really intimidated when they see like the larger work of like oh well there is this action today there is this pro- protest but it's like a lot of the work is being done behind the scenes right exactly exactly yeah that's that's what i in actively because in especially in this culture that um you know with social media and posting everything online and you know a lot of performative work that's not where it's at so that is why people like you you know that's why you're on this show because your work has been so much behind the scenes and getting, you know, really like putting people together. And that's what organizing is all about and not just being on the stage. And, you know, so this is something that I really want to hit home with, with our audience is each one of you can be potentially Jenny and putting people together. And that is where, that's where how we build people power. Um, so coming back to climate change, Why did, you know, when we, you look at like uh, the list of things that um, affect marginalized communities and, you know, each one of us has limited time and ability or uh, limited uh, resources. What, what made you think this was the issue that was extremely important for you to get involved with, raise awareness about uh, climate change um, and how it disproportionately affects marginalized communities? So I think that with climate justice, it affects everything, right? Like it is so interconnected beyond what people often think of right off the surface in terms of people working these cold jobs that are not sustainable. So it's harming their bodies. They're not being paid well um, to, you know, methane plants being put in urban black and brown communities and people who do not have the sufficient political economic power to resist that in the same, in the, in the ways that white communities do. Right. Cause they're not going to put that in an upper class white community because they'll, they'll throw a fit and it's over mm. that plan. They wouldn't even think about putting it there, but why do, you know, 
the millionaires and billionaires and politicians put these heavily contaminating industries right in the heart of black and brown communities. I think that is extremely problematic. It is morally wrong. I mean, that is why a lot of black and brown folks have um, higher asthma rates, higher cancer rates. And then on top of that, going back to the jobs. So if we can create green energy jobs, then we can hire more people and give them a living wage. I think that, you know, climate justice really brings together racial justice, economic justice, and then also immigrants. I mean, we talk a lot about, you know, corruption. We talk a lot about um, U.S. interventionism abroad, especially in Latin America. But it's like when we really think about it, the same industries that are being shipped abroad into the global south is really deteriorating the environment. So people are, are being forced to flee their homes mm -hmm. because of mass flooding, because of higher intensity of hurricanes. They're being forced to migrate. So they're, you know, we're seeing more the term climate refugees become a more relevant um, term that we're using. And so, yeah. And in locally too, you've talked about uh, here, I, here's a quote from you. For decades, working class communities and communities of color like mine have been first to be hit by pollution and last to be rebuilt after a climate disaster. This is, and really that is where the crux of the issue is, is that again, this is, this is not just a climate justice issue, it is a racial justice issue as well. It is a working class issue as well. Um, what, how, how has this directly impacted your community? I think definitely um, in terms of the, the plants and the industries being closer to mine, I think also when we think about um, natural disasters and stuff, where do they go to repair the infrastructure and to repair the electricity first and foremost, mm -hmm. they're gonna go to the white communities. They're not gonna go to the immigrant communities. They're, gonna, they're not gonna go to the black communities. Um, on top of that too, when we think about um, Latino communities at large in the United States, Donald Trump has repeatedly talked about building a stupid border wall that is disrupting wildlife, that is disrupting nature, that is really not good for the, the planet. And then on top of that is creating more obstacles for people who are fleeing from climate change to be able to migrate to the United States. So those are the ways that it has really affected and impacted my community. Um, because when I think about my community, I'm not only thinking about the Cuban community, I'm thinking about Latino communities at large. I remember that after Hurricane Maria and the devastation that that caused, there was a lot more Puerto Ricans in my community because they had to relocate from Puerto Rico. So definitely all of those things um, I'm constantly thinking about um, when it comes to climate justice and the ways that it impacts folks so like me. A few quick actionable steps that you'd give everyday citizens who might be watching local governments can take to foster positive changes in the community uh, to best support the environment. I think definitely applying pressure. Um, oftentimes we talk at large about like national politics, but there's so much that we can apply to uh, pressure to local <laughs> politics, like definitely like Metro Council. Another issue that we've been dealing with in Louisville is like 52,000 trees are being cut down, which down, which, you know, when you think about it or when you bring it up to someone, oh, that's some hippie stuff, like you're trying to hug a tree. No, like that's a serious issue. We're not, it's not just some hippie stuff that affects the quality of the air that we're breathing. So, you know, pushing for a tree ordinance in which um, there's a quota of how many uh, trees will be planted each year. I think that's ambitious policy that can be achieved across local communities. I think also pushing for a local version of a Green New Deal to a state version of a Green New Deal. I think definitely going into these town hall meetings where politicians or candidates are at and be like, hey, like we need you to support and embrace publicly and openly a Green New Deal. And if you don't, we will apply pressure. We will escalate. I think escalation is a key tactic that, you know, all kinds of civil rights leaders have used to apply pressure. Exactly. So one of the um, piece gems that I picked up from there that I hope people are paying attention to is local action. You know, all politics is local. Everything like what affects you, it's nothing is too 
small to be relevant. And it, whether it's, you know, your city, town hall council, your city, uh, city or town council, whether it's your local school boards, whether it's putting um, education, uh, educational elements into your local school curriculum on, on the environment, so much can be done locally. Uh, that we, you know, in this whole national politi uh, politics, we forget the work that can be done in your, where you live and where it affects you directly. Now, let's talk about another branch of your work. And I know it, it weaves into your uh, the work that you do in, in climate justice. But immigration rights, what does this topic represent for you? What does immigrant rights mean? Immigrant rights for me means that people anywhere and everywhere have the rights, the universal rights to migrate. And um, we should not have some kind of security apparatus, whether it's DHS, ICE detaining people for the God-given right to migrate, especially from the same problems that settler countries like the United States have created abroad and overseas and have caused a lot of devastation and chaos that led for these people to migrate. So I think it's a much more encompassing term than like what we like to think about. I think it's also creating a pathway to citizenship for all undocumented people. And it's also abolishing ICE. We do not need ICE. Mm -hmm. ICE was a reactionary response to 9-11 um, and has caused for the detainment of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of immigrants, many of whom you know, have gotten sick in their cells, have even died in ICE detention. Um, and more recently, with the arrival of COVID-19, many of these people have been deported to their countries. And that has caused the spread of COVID-19 across the Caribbean, for example. Um, so when I think about immigrant rights, I think about um, supporting immigrants, embracing immigrants, welcoming immigrants, and stop creating the conditions for folks to have to flee from violence in their home countries. Mm. And so can you share with us some of the work that has been is being done on that in your local region? What are the current, um, when you talk about abolishing ICE, what um, steps have been taken locally? I do remember in 2018, um, there was like the waves of like people occupying the ICE um, buildings and offices and whatnot. And I think that was really great to apply pressure. But what I would have loved to see more of was the continuation of applying that pressure and then also connecting the dots that if we're saying defund and abolish the police, then we're also saying defund and abolish ICE because the two collude with each other. I mean, they both come construct the police state. And so what's been what's been done in my community is um, there's been some immigrant organizations that have been creating more like legal aid funds and then um, connecting people um, with lawyers and then also connecting volunteers um, to serve as accompaniments in the court and filling up the courtroom. Because mm -hmm. people have said that when you fill up the courtroom, that can apply pressure for um, the judge to decide not to deport people. Um, I think also there's been a lot of mutual aid um, being done to support immigrant communities because a lot of undocumented people did not have any kind of access mm -hmm. to uh, federal aid, especially those $1,200 checks. So how can we support them in this time of need? Um, a lot of that has uh, been done, especially behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. um, also applying pressure to our politicians to take a stance. Um, I think obviously a lot more work needs to be done. I think a lot more work needs to be done in general to connect the dots nationwide, right? Because it, it's a it's a greater struggle. I mean, we're at, we are demanding for systemic change. So I, I definitely want to encourage people that if you're saying defund, abolish the police, that we're also saying defund and abolish ICE, and that we're also educating our communities on what that looks like. Um, but yeah, yes, and it's definitely across the country. ICE and the police work together hand in hand. Many of the sheriff departments, many police departments have contracts with ICE um, where a, a simple traffic light stop could end up, you know, asking for papers, taking you in, you know, into a detention center. Um, are there many detention centers in Kentucky? There is a detention center in Northern Kentucky. And then there's also um, an ICE building here in downtown Louisville. 
Um, and I do know that a lot of um, Latino immigrants are being detained um, in the detention center, as mm -hmm. well as um, African migrants as well, mm -hmm. even Muslim folks as well. And the conditions in that detention center, just like in any detention center, is God awful. It's inhumane. That's, um, I, you know, doing this work as a woman, many times we face a lot of hurdles, um, blockages, uh, things that are unexpected, yet we carry on. And um, a lot of, a lot of um, emotional, social expectations are placed on, on women in this work. I wanted to, you to share with you, what have your, been your personal um, you know, blockades that people have placed in your work and, you know, how have you overcome them? Um, definitely being a woman, you feel like your work is oftentimes erased, right? Because it's like, oftentimes what happens is um, cisgender straight men will gravitate towards the mic and they will announce themselves, I am the movement leader, I am this and that. But you don't see them oftentimes at a lot of meetings that mm -hmm. happen behind the scenes, right? And so it's like that erasure of femme labor, of women's labor um, that happens all the time in, any, in many movement spaces. That's something that is straight from the history books that happens, right? I mean, I know that Angela Davis talks about her experience um, about that from the Black Panthers. Um, so that's definitely an obstacle because um, I think men need to realize their privilege, um, especially um, as straight men when they take up space and it's like they're not acknowledging the labor that's being done behind the scenes. I think that oftentimes the people who are like the OGs, like the classics of the movement are always women. We do so much labor. Um, but men oftentimes want to co-op that labor and be like, I'm the movement leader. And then it's really problematic as well, because it's like, I think we're shifting um, now away from that kind of paradigm around mm -hmm. that dynamic of like, here's like the one or two leader. And it's like, that's not safe. I mean, from a security standpoint, that's not safe. I mean, that's how Malcolm X was targeted. That's how MLK was targeted. And the future really relies on decentralization, right? How, how can we build people power from the ground up? How can we mobilize as many young people as we can? How many uh, workers can we mobilize at, you know, to, to be more engaged, to be more present. It's not just about one leader or two le uh, leaders. The movement and the cause is much larger than just one person or two people. Um, so I wish men would realize that more and actually uh, attend more meetings. I think that's something that constantly happens, right? Is that erasure? Mm -hmm. and have, so where have, in your um, circle, where have you found the spaces that have really uplifted you? Where where has that upliftment come from to help keep going? Because it's it's it, this is tough work. People don't realize how unless you're doing it, unless you're doing it every day, it's it's the small phone calls, it's the emails, it's the, you know, all it's all that background stuff that doesn't seem important at that moment. So what keeps you uplifted? What keeps you going? Where are those spaces that you find yourself being um, and your voice being heard? I think definitely um, the work can, like what you said, feel very isolating, very alienating. And so there, it's always important to keep that balance of having, yes, friends in the movement, but also friends that aren't necessarily like activists per se, that do support you, that do uplift you, that will embrace you, that will laugh with you and cry with you. Mm -hmm. And also, um, taking time to take a break, um, to recharge a bit. I think that's also really important. Or like, you know, with your movement friends being like, okay, from this time, from, I don't know, from seven to 9 p.m., we're just not gonna talk about movement stuff. We're gonna talk about being young. I think uplifting those boundaries at time are really important. Um, but also like with movement elders, you know, I when I think about my movement uh, elders, I think oftentimes of women, I think that they really understand that. I think that they're super supportive of that. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so, yeah, I mean, finding different sources of light, of being able to re-energize and get back in the game, I think that's super important. So I've definitely found that from a variety of folks um, within movement and outside of movement space. Mm, exactly. You need to have that someone, somebody, you know, that time. And then to set boundaries are so important to keep going because a lot of times you won't see, like you said, that maybe this, we won't see change, maybe not even in our lifetime, but maybe we will, right? So you always have to live between that hope and that fear. Um, and that keeps, that's definitely a keeps that going. Um, how, you know, one of the other things that I, I, I often think about is a lot of times uh, people forget that, that there's still a really long fight ahead. Um, you know, when we saw all those women come out for the Women's March the first time. And, and I remember, you know, being really excited about that because it was like, but then you go, when you, when you go there, you organize for it and you get there. And then it was a very like exoticizing experience. Like everybody would stop us on the streets and, oh, can we take a picture? Like we a lot of us felt like caged animals sort of like let loose in this this zoo i don't know safari I, it was very bizarre and it, it really like turned out but it was just like okay that happened and now like look at women like uh, american women they're all like just all the rights have been achieved and every you know so it, what and in, um, in seeing this work that in part of part of your work is women's rights work as well what would you say to people who are looking at the women's rights movement and really as a young person, as a person who's been, especially someone who's studying internationally, uh, has seen the struggles across the globe and some, sometimes seen uh, the really, really deep work that has been done in, in the global south compared to the sort of sometimes shallow work that is being done here. Um, would love to get your comment on that. Were you feeling that way, like uh, the Women's March, like out of tokenization, like, oh, like here are the hijabis, like, was that your experience? Yes, it was, It that was part of it, especially in the first one. The second one I didn't go to because I was so disgusted by my experience in the first one. And then the third one, we it was much more locally led in DC. Uh, we had a lot of local organizers who were being uplifted and their voices were being centered so we we organized a women's um sec, you know a muslim women's uh contingent uh and then this year I, then after that i was just like done uh with the way they treated zahra bilu and other um uh, organizers so um so I'm, i sort of like washed my hands off of that but um i did like it was very interesting to see that and i'd love to get a perspective from somebody who is doing this work on a daily basis i think oftentimes like non-white women often get really tokenized and so it's you know again like setting up those boundaries like no you will not tokenize me like no i'm not I'm not your pet I'm not your po puppet i'm not your minority token i'm definitely not your minority token um i think also when you say about the long work that's ahead of us i I, I want people to realize like we cannot afford to get complacent because i remember like you know now that we're talking about how problematic the women's march was I don't know if you remember like that, that was like a, a picture of it was like these white women. If Hillary was in office, I'd be having brunch right now. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, no, and no. Like, mm -hmm. yes, like now we have like a straight up fascist in office, but neoliberalism is the death of many people, mm -hmm. right? Her policies have costed entire nations like Libya to straight up crumble, mm -hmm. right? And there's no plan in place. It created a political vacuum. And now we have sub-Saharan migrants being trafficked and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, dying in the Mediterranean Sea. But uh, I, I want white people to understand their place and their privilege and the consequences of those kinds of harmful comments and how much that erases other people's struggles as well. Because, you know, that highlights how things, how little things affects their day to day. Whereas, you know, for Muslim people, for Latinx people, for Black folks, it, it's way different. It, it affects us on the daily 
And it not only has repercussions for us here, but it also has repercussions for our families abroad. Um, so definitely, I want it doesn't to matter who's in, uh, in in the White House. It does not matter at this point who's in the White House. Because yeah, exactly. It does not matter. It does not matter. I mean, like Obama literally deported more people than Bush did. OK, like I'm pretty sure Obama dropped more drones than Bush did. And that speaks volumes. I mean, Bush like in, like legally invaded another country. So I want people to understand, like, whether you decide to vote or whether you decide to, you know, not be part of that process. If we do get Biden and Kamala Harris in the White House by 2021, we need to be applying so much pressure. We need to be in their faces. Straight up, like we cannot be like, oh, well, there's a Democrat. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, I mean, people abroad and people here like feel the consequences, rather wh whether there's a Democrat or a Republican in office. I mean, Biden paved the way for mass in incarceration. That is why we see the school to prison pipeline. That is why the United States has the highest incarceration rates in the world, even though the United States only constitute 4% of the global population. So I want people to understand that we need to be, uh, be applying pressure. But then on top of that, we need to be pushing forward uh, for folks like AOC to be elected, that we have more AOCs, that we have more Rashidas and Ilhan Omars and Charles Bookers across the nation. I think that we also need to be consistent with our organizing and not just be reactionary, mm -hmm. right? I'm so tired of turning on the news or, you know, going to Facebook and saying that another black person has been murdered at the hands of the state. I'm tired of these hashtags. Like, I, I don't want to see no more hashtags. I don't want to mm -hmm. see that. I don't want to see more escalations between the United States and Iran. We need to have people who are actually competent to lead. And if they can't lead, we got to push them out of office. But we have to also think with the vision beyond just electoral politics. We need to be empowering people. We need to be educating people. And I think um, that's going to be extremely important because oftentimes I think that, you know, the United States is such an insular uh, society, right? Because we talk about how limited the rights of people are abroad. But it's like when we really think about it, traveling is really inaccessible for a lot of Americans. I think that that's often also why that if you're not a, an American who has immigrant parents, you don't understand the realities in other places because you haven't been to those realities. You know, if only like 10% of Americans have access to a U.S. passport, then you know what I'm saying? So it's yeah. like, how can we also foster cultural exchange? How can we also foster education how do we push to change the curriculum in public schools i think that we need to be hitting the target with all kinds of tactics and so you know if your role is education stick to education change the curriculum demand ethnic studies be a mandatory subject in public school and in universities if your role is direct actions and you want to risk arrest go for it let's do it you know what i'm saying Hopefully it'll be nonviolent, but you know, I'm not I'm not someone to tell people how they should protest. You see what I'm saying? Like it needs to be a variety of tactics. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time, Jenny. We're at the end of the hour and I've just really enjoyed this conversation. It was great from our other guest who has 40 years of experience doing this, and then to see some fresh ideas, um, you know, and, and, and really like people need to see themselves in the role that you're in. And thank you for being that for a lot of young people out there. So um, I'm so glad uh, our mutual friend, uh, Rena recommended uh, to have feature your work in, in the series. I love Rena. She's such a baddie. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Um, and to all our audience, thank you so much for joining us on Muslim Network TV. We'll be here tomorrow. Salam alaikum.